Hi, I'm Dr. John Hovanesian. The correction of astigmatism during cataract surgery is a simple process that adds a great deal of value for patients undergoing this procedure. In this video, we're going to talk about four simple steps surgeons can take to get started doing LRIs to reduce or eliminate astigmatism during cataract surgery. Many surgeons are reluctant to begin using LRIs in their practice because of a number of perceptions that the LRIs are not accurate, that they have a risk of perforation, that they are technically difficult to do, and that they may regress. And as we're going to show in this video, with the right approach, LRIs involve very simple calculations and a lasting refractive effect that doesn't wear off. If you're wondering why you should begin offering your patients LRIs, consider that a patient's astigmatism is determined by the sum of the astigmatism in both the cornea and the lens. Before cataract surgery, most patients' vectors of corneal and lenticular astigmatism cancel each other out to at least some degree. In this example, a patient has one diopter of corneal astigmatism, steep at 90 degrees, and one diopter of lenticular astigmatism at 180. In this very common scenario, the patient's pre-op spectacle refraction is spherical. What happens when cataract surgery is performed using a non-toric implant? Let's assume in this example that the clear corneal incision doesn't induce any astigmatism of its own. In this case, the lens, of course, is now spherical, and the only remaining determinant of astigmatism is the cornea. The patient ends up with a diopter of postoperative astigmatism, even though there was none before surgery. There are two lessons to be learned here. First, most patients' astigmatism increases after routine cataract surgery. And second, we can't use the pre-op spectacle refraction as a predictor of post-op astigmatism because spectacle refraction doesn't take into account the change in lenticular astigmatism, and it also doesn't account for incision-induced astigmatism. The next reason to do LRIs is shown nicely here. This simulation of one diopter of astigmatism shows you what your patient sees after surgery. The difference between having and not having a diopter of astigmatism is the detail in the palm trees, the clarity of the people's faces, the subtlety of what's happening in the waves. Patients who have a little astigmatism after surgery are not likely to complain about their surgical result, but patients who can see details like the right-hand picture are going to be really delighted referrers of all their friends and family. Another important reason to offer an LRI is that patients simply can't benefit from the newest presbyopia correcting lens implants when they have residual astigmatism. As Guy Kazurian has shown very nicely with data from his Surgivision data link website, there's a substantial loss of visual acuity with all premium lenses when residual astigmatism goes uncorrected. Reimbursement for limbal relaxing incision is not included in the global fee for cataract surgery from Medicare, and it's billed to patients with a separate code. There's an excellent article on this topic of reimbursement by Sue Corcoran in the Ophthalmology Management's August 1, 2008 issue. This can be found on the Ophthalmology Management website. The first step in doing LRIs is to know the effect of your corneal incision, your so-called surgically induced astigmatism, or SIA. For most surgeons who use a temporal clear corneal approach, the incision causes about a half a diopter of flattening at the axis of the incision. To calculate more exactly your own SIA, you can use a really simple and very handy calculator available at the website shown here. You'll need to input each patient's age, the incision size and axis, any history of prior corneal surgery, and pre- and post-op keratometry values. You'll do this for 20 or 30 patients. It'll give you a report showing how much astigmatic effect your cataract incisions have at any axis where you have input data. It's worth mentioning here that the accuracy of your calculations is only as good as the accuracy of your measurements. Dry eye or any condition that disrupts a perfect tear film during keratometry measurements needs to be cleared up before you can trust those measurements. Okay, step two is to know your patient's corneal astigmatism. There are a growing number of ways to measure this, and the most commonly used are keratometry, IOL master measurements, and corneal topography. To get accurate manual keratometry measurements, besides having a good tear film, you'll need to calibrate the instrument periodically using the little steel calibration balls that come with the machine. Also, you'll need to make sure that the ocular of the instrument is properly focused for the technician who's doing the measurements. IOL master keratometry readings can be very useful preoperatively for LRIs, but they need to be checked, checked against the keratometry values for consistency. Finally, video keratography, or corneal topography, often provides the most useful information when planning an LRI because rather than just measuring a few points on the corneal surface, it gives curvature information for thousands of points. 
The topographer simulated keratometry or SIMK readings are of more limited use though because these data points are calculated from just one or two points on the cornea around the three millimeter axis. Instead, from the axial map, it's worthwhile to get a general sense of the shape of the cornea. Pay most attention to values in the central two millimeters, which is the region of the cornea that most determines refractive astigmatism. Now on the Humphrey Atlas topography, each little white square corresponds to one square millimeter, so it's easy to get an idea where to look. First, determine the magnitude of astigmatism by matching up the colors on the topography map with the dioptric color key on the side. And sometimes this is easier to do on the computer screen rather than a printout. On this map, the steepest corneal colors correspond to about 46.7 diopters, while the flattest or more blue colors match up pretty well at 44.3. So that's a difference of 2.4 diopters, which is what we'll call the magnitude of astigmatism. To determine the axis of astigmatism, draw a line or just lay a ruler on the color map and run it along the steepest meridian of the map. This will point toward the axis that you should target. In this case, it's 102 degrees. So our astigmatism in this case is 2.4 diopters, steep at 102. That's a fairly high amount of astigmatism for an LRI, so let's plan the procedure. Fortunately, the website shown here makes this very simple to plan the procedure. You choose which nomogram you'd like to use, and the interactive web page will ask for the required data, and then it will give you a printout telling you exactly where the limbal incisions should be located. It'll also give you a picture showing the orientation for a surgeon given where you would like to sit, either temporally or superior, whatever you choose. The next step is doing the procedure itself. You'll need just a few items, a diamond knife and a way to find the axis at a very minimum. In this video, I'll be showing you my technique with instruments from Stortz, available at stortzeye.com. Because some patients' eyes can rotate when they go from an upright to a lying position, it's ideal to mark the horizontal and vertical meridians and to do so before the eye is dilated. This can be done in the pre-op area using a methylene blue marker. After getting preparacaine, the patient covers the non-operative eye with the, while the examiner closes one eye. The patient then fixates on the examiner's one open eye. This allows alignment, so the examiner can then line up the marker and place a dot at the temporal and at the inferior limbus. Each mark, when compared with the center of the undilated pupil, should define a line, either parallel or exactly perpendicular to the floor. This way, even if the pupil center moves after dilation, you'll know exactly where to center your LRI procedure. Now, with the patient prepped and draped on the table, we're ready for the LRI. Like most surgeons, I prefer to do LRIs before I do the cataract procedure for a couple of reasons. First, there are no incisions to leak, and second, the cornea has not yet been hydrated. I use a Mendez marker, lining it up so the horizontal and the vertical hash marks line up with the ink marks that were just made in the pre-op area. This way, we know the axis of our incisions will be correct. Each minor mark on the Mendez marker corresponds to 10 degrees. So sometimes you have to interpolate or estimate when the desired axis falls in between. Here we're making two 30 degree cuts centered at 170 degrees, the steep axis. I'm using .12 forceps to indent the cornea as a mark. First we'll find the axis where the LRI will be centered. Then we'll make a mark on each side of that axis to show the beginning and the end of the LRI cut. For this 30 degree cut, I'm marking the cornea 15 degrees on either side of the steep axis. When cutting the tissue, you simply connect the dots with an arc that parallels the limbus, but it's important to keep the blade as perpendicular as possible to the corneal surface because this ensures that the blade will reach the intended depth. By unintentionally tilting the blade, you're going to achieve less depth and an undercorrection. When the blade first enters the tissue, pause for a second to let it penetrate those deepest lamellae. Then advance the blade very smoothly. Before withdrawing the blade, again pause for a second to make sure the cut has been fully made. When doing the cataract procedure itself, some surgeons like to do on-axis cataract surgery, where they put their main incision on the site of the cornea steepest meridian. While some believe this aids in their precision, most experienced LRI surgeons just keep their primary incision consistently temporal and then factor in that incision's well-known effect into their LRI calculation. When you're new to doing LRIs, it's probably best to keep that cataract incision wherever you normally put it.